All right, you guys know that I've got an absolute ton of critters. We got fish, we got plants, we got everything. It's so out of control. You guys just know that's just the way it is. But there's one group of animals that honestly I've never kept. A lot of people ask about bigs. When are you gonna have this? When are you gonna have that? Never ever came up before. However, so we've done builds for you know big tarantulas. There's big boy at the back there, and we've done builds for the big giant ge geckos and so forth. But the one group in question I've never really kept is dart frogs. And these particular dart frogs, these blue ones, this is an original piece of artwork that was given to me by a dear friend from the artist Sam Scales. And it's, uh, I believe, it's, it's, the, it's the bright blue Dendrobates uh, Tincurtinus uh, Azurius is the one I know. But I remember when I was in Vancouver, I've seen lots of people have these frogs, I've seen all sorts of other types of frogs, all sorts, but it's particularly the blue ones that have really, really caught my eye because blue is such an unnatural color in nature, you just don't see it. So I thought one day we're gonna do it and maybe today's the day. So I went and picked up one of these. It's 36 long, 18 wide, and 24 tall. And it's an exoterra, and it's clearly made for all these critters. But we're gonna have to change it up a little bit if we're gonna make it specifically for dart frogs. So I've been playing around in the basement for the better part of a couple hours now, trying to come up with some ideas. Now, this giant piece of Malaysian driftwood looks like a nice big, it's obviously some sort of a type of a stump. So they're all just kind of dry fitted in there. I'm just trying to get an idea. I try to create when I, same thing when I do uh, aquascaping versus doing setting up vivariums, is I try to set up what I call rooms. Different areas within the enclosure that ind individual animals can go off and things. Now, generally, most people that know anything about dart frogs, dart frogs are usually kept as a pair. Well, I don't want to do that. When I was in Vancouver and I saw this giant communal of the blues, I thought that's exactly what I want to do. So I've talked to a few of the, the hardcore frog people. Yep, that's a thing. And they told me that with the, the, the blues that they can be done as long as they're bought together all at the same time and kind of all released together at the same time. So that's what we're, that's our intention. That's what we're going to do with that. So I've got this nice big stump in place here. I've got this other piece of Malaysian wood. And we've got some nice big solid uh, planting areas up top here. This is actually my plan is to raise this up. I'm just using some filter foam. Uh, but my plan is to raise this up that this is almost at the, the top line here. So this will go up probably about another two inches or so, which means everything will go up about another two inches or so. I'm kind of liking that uh, secondary piece about there. It gives me the nice planting zones, different things like that. And the one plant we are going to put in here is we've got a whole bunch of different types of bromeliads, and that's going to be kind of the primary focus. Let's take a peek at those. So the growing wall is doing really, really, really well. I've taken uh, the advice of several... Uh, well-known well aquascapers, not necessarily, no, sorry, not aquascapers, terrarium builders. And I've set up this kind of tub wall and I've bought a lot of plants and I've just kind of set them up and let them kind of take off on their own. And that way, most of them, like all the different magravias and different things that are in that bottom one, I can take cuttings off of them and still leave the adult plants in there to keep reproducing. But the bucket in question we're looking for is that one right there. So my good friends, Ivan and Cheyenne over at Species Canada, they had a lot of these really, really cool vermilions. I like the idea that they're predominantly green. I don't like the idea of them being bright pink, bright red, particularly for this vivarium where I want the only real, real bright splash of color to be the frogs themselves. I want everything else to be kind of somewhat subtle, but we do have a little bit of patterning and stuff on the leaves, a lot of dark greens and bright greens. So these ones here are primarily gonna be the plants, but I do have one particular accent vermilion. It's a little bit bigger. And it's more than likely going to end up probably up in this space here. Let's go take a peek at it. When you come into the nerd room, you can see there's stuff staged everywhere. Hi, Larry. How are you doing, Larry? <laughs> but uh, I've got these nice big ones. They've got a lot of nice, nice variegation. They get a little bit of color on the new growth. They're a little bit rough right now, but that's okay. That's no problem at all. With some good lighting and good humidity, these things are going to absolutely thrive in this new environment. I do have two of them, but due to the size of them and how big they actually get, I think I'm only going to use one as an accent plant. And I like the fact that it's got those kind of striations on the leaf. will also kind of look very, very similar to that, uh, the green one that I just showed you in the tub that also has the striations. And they'll, they'll contrast each other nicely. But still to being kind of subtle in coloration, really letting the animal show off. So before we actually get it to the next stage, 
I'm going to have to just take some pictures, you know, get some ideas, take some pictures from below, from the front, from above, get an idea of exactly where every piece is going to go and how it's supposed to look. So I can really see my vision because once I take this all out of there, it'll be kind of hard to put it back together unless I know exactly what I want to do. Now, I also want to probably go and foam out a portion of the side walls as well as the entire back of this environment. So here we go with the, the first time lapse, putting on down the foam. This time I'm using the Great Stuff Pond Foam, which is meant for outdoors. It's black instead of yellow. Honestly, I don't know. I don't notice much of a difference between any of them. They all work. To, they all do the exact same job. Perhaps uh, the black one also maybe has UV inhibitors. Don't really know, but it works just the same as the others. I didn't go right down to the very bottom because uh, the bottom of the terrarium is going to be full of substrate. Uh, the drainage layer and then the substrate for planting. So I left a good six inches, same as that front. And then I did the same on the sides. Had to let one side, had to let them cure in kind of in between so it didn't really sag at all. Let it go. Now I'm going over it just quickly with a light, mainly looking for holes or spots that maybe it's a little bit thinner, things I want to build up a little bit and so forth. So that's all I'm really doing there. And then we did the other side. Now we're almost ready for the next step. All right, so the foam is all nice and cured now. We're ready for the next step. Now, the one thing that you'll note is using this uh, great stuff, the black stuff, which is generally used for outdoor work for ponds and so forth, for adhering rocks together, making waterfalls and stuff, is the stuff does not expand as much as some of the yellow ones. So it's a little bit tighter and it's a little bit harder to work with to expose that inner foam layer. And we have to go and take off all the shiny material to be able to start the next step. So it's a large process to go and do something, even just on this scale, which is 36 by 18 by 24. So I'm going to take a trick out of uh, Troy Goldberg's uh, page, Troy's Tropical Garage. He's probably one of the best authorities for things dart frogs. And he uses a drill and a wire brush. And it takes makes pretty quick work of this stuff. You just have to be careful when you're going to go anywhere near touching the glass, because this could scratch the glass. But uh, if, you, if you can control it, it can make the work go a real lot faster. To say this is messy is an understatement. I don't know if I, I should have done this in the basement on the carpet, but, <laughs> but I had my little tarps down and everything like that, and the vacuum made pretty quick work of it, cleaning it up. But it sure makes work go real, real fast, and it gives a much more, I don't know, maybe more of a natural stone kind of a look to it. It only seems to be a bit more weathered looking instead of pulling away individual chunks like we generally do. So thumbs up to Troy Goldberg for... If this is his idea, original idea or not, I don't know, I can't say, but that's where I saw it first. And uh, it works really, really, really well. Good. So we did the back, took a little bit of time to get used to it. I have a very powerful drill, so it wants to pull, but it worked well. Okay, overall, I think we're pretty good. We've got a Nice, good texture base. We had some uh, some of the foam that didn't really overhear very well here. But that's okay. We got some solutions to cover that problem. It's not necessarily a problem. But overall, the effect is exactly what we wanted. Now, the most important step is sealing it. And to seal it, we use a product called Dry Lock. It comes in a white base, a gray base, and you can buy all sorts of different concrete colors. And it's exactly, that's exactly what it is. It is a concrete waterproofer. It's designed for, for basements that have a bit of seepage or something like that. But it works very, very well and adheres very, very well to the foam. I generally put on two coats. My first coat was a little bit thick, so I had some little drips. But uh, it worked very well. And then, next step is the hardscape. Not just getting it in place, but anchoring it in place, anchoring the pieces together, as I'd mentioned at the beginning. Putting some, using, I'm, this time I'm using some of the yellow foam. It's just what I had on hand. And I'm anchoring all the individual anchor points. And I've also gone and cleaned up all the ones, the little individual spots that I see along the back wall that anything may be showing. Don't worry, all this will be concealed anyways in the next step. looks pretty good. Quick little touches. The next step, again, same as what we did, but instead of using the drill on this one, I'm going to use my hands and a knife because it's a bit more finer work, a bit more detail-oriented work, not just large slabs. 
make it look a little bit more natural follow along you can see on the on the right our left hand side there where the it seems to be that the walls tended to separate from the glass a little bit and i filled that in with some foam to give it a nice clean edge we're going to cover this all up again right away anyways and here we go here we're going to add some silicone this is 100 percent silicone good for aquarium use that's not it's meant for windows and doors so it works great once the silicone's all in place i covered up even all those little individual holes along the wall it was all ready to go for the last step, and that is just covering it. You can use peat moss, you can use cocoa fiber, you can, I've used some aspects of my substrate mix before, but it's all just covered up. Now we're gonna let it cure for about 24 hours, and then we're gonna go and brush it off using a paintbrush, brush off any of the loose material, vacuum it out, and that brings us to the end of today. Next step will be planting. But that's a second video as we take a quick little look at all some of the finer details of this vivarium. I look forward to seeing you guys and showing you guys what we're going to do next. Very exciting journey for me, having never done this before, and I very much look forward to it. So thank you as always, my friends. Take care. Uh -huh.